Ah, il est passé oh sur la oh super oh l'artiste Super oh Encore un but sensationnel Hello everyone and welcome to the Uninformed Handball Hour. And good news for the Scandinavians, they're back. Uh, they're better, well they're not better than before, but they, they seem to have refound their mojo just at the right time in the main round of EHF Euro 2022. We're going to talk about that and everything we've seen over the last couple of days. It's Chris O'Reilly here with Alex Kulish. Hey, Chris. Brian Campion has just joined us from the arena in Bratislava. How are you, Brian? Hello, Chris. Hello, Alex. Good to be here. Good to have you, Brian. Good to have you. And we're going to start with the last game we all just saw as we record here on a Friday night. Yeah, we're doing things large here on the weekend on the Uninformed Handball Hour. Brian, you just saw... Norway versus Germany live. We were watching it from afar. And it looks like Norway have kind of found their mojo. What did you make of what you saw? I think it's really encouraging for Norway. Um from from what I've I saw the game anyway, it, it seemed to me that it was more their second string of players that really <clears throat> excuse me. Their second string of players that took them over the line, which is something maybe we were critical of coming into the Euro thinking that they didn't really have anyone else but their their classic starting seven. And for someone like Eric Toff to get player of the match, I think was uh it's just encouraging overall because they do have a little bit of depth there that they can they can call upon. And yeah, and it's nice to also see someone who's called Toft who's not from Denmark. <laughs> exactly. But but it's still a redhead though. Still a redhead. But it's it's great that Norway have been forced into this situation um to explore their wider squad. Um Eric Toft is is a perfect example in this tournament. Ua Jordit. So Ua Jordit has been <laughs> a really good player who's gotten uh, some good opportunities. Salsad on the line. You know, it you you can see that there is um, a broader team uh, in this Norway squad and bit by bit Christian Berger while just forced to do it um, it, he's been able to integrate them and maybe you know the the couple of first games that, that were a bit rough you know that that's all part of the journey and uh, if he again uh, if he was a bit more ambitious it could have been uh, a, an even more exciting journey but yeah, you know, on the other side, it, I thought Germany were really interesting to um, watch how they played because you know we always talk about the the German style, the really systematic. Every single second is planned out. There are you know movements upon movements and variations that everyone is perfectly in sync, and then this Germany team has just. A bunch of guys that have got together very recently and are playing underage handball. Like <laughs> just move the ball from side to side, try to break through, let your big guys shoot, and um and that's been a little bit effective for them, but um obviously it's 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 tough um for them in the situation yeah. that they're in. I, I who expected that we'd be talking about two lads from Morse T in Denmark, uh, in Eric Toft and Sander Irvi Ordit. And Eric Toft in particular, seven goals from 10 shots in this one. And yeah, it was really nice to see the Norwegians uh, use their depth. And it's going to be so important for them as we go into the last couple of rounds in this main round, which is really wide open. Uh, the Germans had the worst possible start to this main round when you look at their opposition, two teams that have kind of been their Achilles heel in recent years, two teams that have dealt them crushing blows in Norway and Spain. And uh, yeah, that's a real setback for them. But the situation for them and the way that they're they're playing, I think they're, like Stefan Kretschmar said in the last podcast, um, they're, they're just trying to enjoy it really and, and you can't have any expectations. 
I think it, it was interesting to see Norway play without mm. Sa- Sander Sagesson, or at least not being 100% reliant on him. Again, it's a good development for this Norwegian team as a whole, which has, which still has like a, a bright future ahead of them. But to go away from that Sagesson reliancy is probably a good step for them. And looking at Sander, we've been talking about how you know, he hasn't been at his very best in the tournament. Um, but actually, one thing is that he's not taking seven meter penalties, or at least he's taking very few seven meter penalties for good reason, because Sebastian Bartholz has scored 14 of 15 that he's taken. But in a previous tournaments, a lot of the time, Sagasen's stats would be bumped up and a lot of players in handball have their stats bumped up by seven meters and he has 27 goals in this in in this competition add a potential 15 more seven meters and he's top scorer and we're probably talking about him in a very different light so while Sagason has had his ups and downs i think um we shouldn't we shouldn't really yeah. Can't count him out yet. Diminish the, the good tournament yeah. that he's yeah. having. Can't count him out. Can't count Norway out. Probably still very difficult yeah. for them. But in that, the fact that he scored four from eight, I think, today, uh, the goals he scored, particularly in the second half, were really important goals, though. Uh, he was there to kind of hammer home the advantage they had. And that's important as well. And that's something that in bigger games that Norway have had to win, he hasn't always been able to deliver on. So that's a positive as well for that team. And just before we move on from the Norway match, uh, there was something that the TV cameras wouldn't have picked up that's actually very important. Probably the most important thing of the whole evening, actually, is directly after the game, Sander Sagerson came over and his fist bumped me and said, oh, podcast man, and uh, walked away. <laughs> that was, uh, so look, that's something. <laughs> Happy days, podcast man. I'm now officially podcast man. That's my superhero uh, alternative identity. I <laughs> oh, love that. Love that. There you go. Building a relationship with them step by step. Uh, nice work, Brian. Uh, and also good going considering you're wearing a mask. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't. I mean, he probably just remembers my massive shiny head from the from the from the Zoom call. So you you don't forget that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was there for all all three games. Obviously, the the, the Polish game. Uh, versus Sweden, the worst game I've seen so far. I mean, that's I don't there's that's really much to say about that. I think Poland just are completely out of gas and they aren't really up to much. I think they've probably achieved what probably what they wanted to achieve in the preliminary round, and then just kind of seem to have nothing going on at the moment. But the Russia Spain game was was really really entertaining, and I think probably in hindsight, us being so hard on Norway coming in have, doesn't seem as bad now. Having with Russia having pushed Spain so hard. I mean, Russia could have ended that massive streak that uh, that Spain are on at several points today. You were looking at them, thinking they look like for for good parts of the game, like like the better team. Um, but then with that, we had that penalty decision at the end that caused a lot of ructions in the hall. People were almost getting to blows at one stage. What? And it was uh, really. Yeah, there was people pushing each other. Yeah, well, cut off and stuff where, where they were shoving yeah. each other and pushing each other back and grabbing each other by the. That was on TV as well. There was uh, handbags, we'll say, mm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it, it was yeah. It was it was. I did actually see the the replay of the the foul back now, but all I know that it was uh, it was a bit a bit of a fifty fifty decision from from what I heard. It was yeah. I mean, my view of it at first was like the defender got there before the winger jumped to take the shot. And in that case, it's attacker foul or nothing at all. Um, the question is, you know, whether the momentum from the winger uh, allowed, would have allowed him to stop or whether he was already in motion. I think that's maybe what the, the question mark was. But, you know, going to the video replay, there's no, there's no real opportunity then to get it wrong uh, from the referee's point of view uh, because they are checking it back. And, uh, yeah, they made the decision based on on the best of their knowledge. Uh, for me, a little bit of karma that they didn't score that one. Uh, not that I didn't want them to. I thought a draw or a Russian victory would have been great for the group uh, in terms of how uh, how tight it would become with that. But then looking at, at Russia as a whole, they, they had a great lead 
for for most of the game. They looked a better team and missed three of their four penalties, which is really costly. You just can't afford to do that. And yeah, Spain gave them a an avenue back into the game uh, right at the end. But yeah, Spain doing what Spain do best. They just grind it out. And what I was most impressed by was when they were three or four goals down, not even like midway through the second half, but fairly late in the second half, they just never looked too panicked. They just kept doing uh, what they knew they could do. And they, they found the chances. Uh, they created opportunities that players, like we mentioned before, like who we didn't expect uh, or we didn't really know would be coming into the squad. Today it was Augustine Casado, who in the pre-championship podcast you talked about, Brian, he stepped up today with seven goals. And uh, both goalkeepers, Rodrigo Corrales with 35% save rate, Gonzalo Perez of Vargas, 46, with six saves from 13. They just know how to get it done. And yeah, they look, they're not safe yet, Spain, but looking really good. It's really interesting because they're in, uh, so now Spain are in pole position in this group. Um, very likely that they'll go through. But it seems like, you know, the, the hits they've taken on the squad may may impact them quite a lot going forward. And they may be, Again, let's let's not doubt Spain because uh, as I predicted at the start of the tournament, is this going to be one of those tournaments where Spain win every game by one or two goals, no matter if it's Czech Republic or Denmark? So it, it could just be Spain being Spain, but um, I I think a draw there would have at least opened up that group a little bit more, as I think Spain are, are ripe for the picking mm-hmm. a little bit. Do you guys know the Amazonian tree frog? I've heard of it. <laughs> it, it. Well, it's it's a it's a very interesting animal. It has one of the thinnest skins of all the animals, and actually can breathe through its skin. It's so thin. And when I was online after the game, I think I saw some creatures on there that even had thinner skin from the Spanish fans. <laughs> <laughs> they were, <laughs> they were, <laughs> several comments online were saying. We've been robbed. I was like, I'm sorry, but you've won the game still. I don't know what exactly you've been robbed of, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if either of you could explain me how Spain were robbed in that regard. It all, they, had the, they had the message ready to go uh, and then decided out of pure spite to just push it out anyway. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> well, uh, it's, yeah, it's going to come down to the wire, I think, no matter what in this group. There's a lot of uh, ways it can pan out over the next few days, either with Spain, uh, Norway, and Sweden, or Sweden, Norway, and Germany uh, in contention. We can talk more about that maybe in the next podcast. More about Group 2 on another day. And before we go into Group 1, <laughs> we're going to speak to one of the hottest players in this championship based on form at the moment. It's Naboysha Simic who's had a couple of fantastic games over the last few days for Montenegro, who are making waves beyond any of us expected and beyond anything that they've done in the EHF Euro in the past. They had a huge victory over Croatia yesterday. And after that, I had a chance to sit down and speak to Nabojša Simic about that victory, about Montenegro's championship as a whole, and about some sleepless nights. Okay, well, I know you've eaten already. No. You haven't? No. I don't oh. have I didn't have time. I oh, you... train, take a shower, did four interviews and you're fit. And then now I go eat. <laughs> okay. And I'll try and make it comfortable for you. No, it's so perfect. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Let's take it back first of all to yesterday. I think that's the natural place to start and the win over Croatia. Uh, can you take us to shortly before the game and uh, you know you're arriving in the arena it's the early game on the first day of the championship um, the arena is kind of quiet at that point but in a situation like that how did it feel in the team did you feel like you were ready to do something big here I think uh, it, it, it uh, felt like we deserve to be here uh, I, I, I never see once uh, my team having some pressure doubts in ourselves we just kind of walk out. It was like a kind of casual, uh, self-confident pe- group of people walking out on the field. 
playing with uh, four meter trick shots before the game and uh, uh, because one of the reasons is we don't have so much pressure like uh, we were always the underdogs and uh, as it was yesterday but uh, we had a lot of uh, self-confidence and a lot of uh, energy and uh, uh, the whole country of Montenegro kind of stood behind us and we are feeling this uh, love and uh, the people cheering us on and just kind of carry us on and then it was like when the game started like boom completely different faces people you know fighting for every ball jumping screaming uh, ke uh, cheering each other it was r uh, really great you mentioned about the support there even the couple of hundred montenegrin fans in the corner they really filled up the entire arena it was uh, quite a sight and quite a noise as well they managed to produce yeah exactly the, the, this is one of the reasons that nobody uh, beat us in montenegro when we have crowd uh, not even denmark uh, uh, Germany, Sweden, nobody when we have crowd because uh, we ha come four or five thousand people and you cannot hear anything. So also when there's like a couple hundred people there but they really are nosy. We don't just like kind of clap and uh, do this thing. We kind of scream, put pressure on other team. It's like a kind of a, you know, Balkan thing and uh, I, that's why you, you could have heard them yesterday. Yeah. I mean, uh, with the Balkan Derby aspect of the game yesterday as well, I mean, uh, Croatia have, they can play a lot of different styles, but they, they do tend to try and dictate the pace in their own way. Can you tell me a little bit about how, how the team prepared for the game and, and how you figured out you were going to force them to play your style of handball? Because it seemed like you really did dictate the way the game was played yesterday. Exactly. I think the power, uh, our power came from our defense yesterday. It was quite an uh, unbelievable de defensive performance. Uh, we, de we made them shoot at the beginning from outside, which I pretty much uh, neutralized the threats. So they have to uh, look the uh, uh, solutions on the line or uh, at the wings. And uh, that's where our 5-1 defense came to life. Uh, and uh, they really had uh, almost no answer in the first half for the defense. Uh, which also allow us to run uh, and uh, make uh, may some uh, make some easy goals on a not uh, well organized defense. Uh, but also when they came came to the defense, we had an amazing shooting performance from our uh, backs, which they hit some goals from way way outside. And then when you try to neutralize that, you open place from uh, pivot and wings, which th they had almost perfect uh, shooting performance. And then it's kind of hard when it go just go like a snowball effect. It's just the snowball gets bigger and bigger and you cannot stop it. And is that how you feel playing a goal as well? Like when you get those early saves, you realize you're neutralizing the only shots that are being allowed. Is it a snowball effect for you and your confidence as well? You seem like a, a player who really does play based on confidence and, and emotion yeah exactly like, like you said uh, when I, st I start coming into the game with these saves and uh, and then uh, 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 later in the game comes a phase when uh, they shoot more maybe from wing six meter but then in this moment I'm pretty much warm with a lot of self-confidence and uh, with a lot of belief and then I, I, I save maybe some really hard shots to save and then when when you pack it all together, it seemed like a like a big performance, but it it, it is based on a, on a, the snowball effect that my team allowed me to get in the really good mood at the beginning, and then it just kind of uh, took on by myself in the second half on a couple of shots. I'm talking to you and I'm talking to you in the past as well. You're you're a very composed, well thought out person when you're off the court, but you kind of become possessed a little bit when you're on the court as well you uh, you seem to turn on a different Naboysha when it comes to playing you you get into players heads in the opposition the way you celebrate really gets your teammates going do you look at yourself sometimes after games or away from the court and say who is that guy or is it a conscious thing you're like okay I'm switching to uh, goalkeeper mode now uh, yeah, um, I never had that feeling when I look at myself. Uh, you know, who is that guy? I always uh, knew you. You know, it was me. I'm I'm a really emotional person, and uh, 
you know when I when I talk to people I may seem calm and stuff but uh, I also get some reactions I always want to win at everything that we play uh, was it the card game was it this and then I get really nervous when I lose and the people use that to promote me make fun <laughs> of me so I, I, I do really competitive and really emotional and um, you know, sometimes I even thought we have a lot of games. Maybe even I had this in, thought in my mind. Maybe if, if we are winning and stuff, maybe should I spare myself a little bit? But there's no way. I said like no way. When I save it, it just comes out of me. I have to do it. I have to show it. I, I love to show it and I live for it. You know, I, if I don't celebrate it, I, my heart wouldn't be in this game, and I have to do it even if it influences me or costs me my voice or some of the energy. But I will find a way to come back. But I just in this moment, I have to do it. And people love you for it as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do really uh, see it. Uh, a lot of people, not only from our country. Our country is insane. The, the fireworks, the driving cars, like like a two three kilometer line with the flags of Montenegro. It's like like spectacle out there, and. Uh, but also people from other countries uh, see our energy and kind of feed on it and it's like uh, unbelievable a lot of support from from like also uh, uh, balkan uh, countries i see it like macedonia croatia bosnia serbia a lot of sh showing a lot of support it's such amazing thing to see because we also had some differences uh, in the past but i i really do think that uh, the sport is one thing that can uh, surpass these things and particularly in Montenegro, with the the women's team have had a lot of success in the past, and, and that was always seen as like a fairy tale story that they were able to get that Olympic silver medal, for example, or win the Euro gold. And now it seems the men's team is coming into focus like never before. You're having your own fairy tale at this point. You've got more victories in this championship than ever before, and and you do feel that also. You, like, of course being away from Montenegro now well, it separates you a little bit but I guess you're getting enough messages and, and videos of, of all the crazy stuff happening in Podgorica to, to make you realize just what big an influence you're having yeah exactly uh, it, it kind of uh, started after the game with Macedonia and then it, it skyrocketed after the game with Slovenia I think my phone w uh, was on fire at this point and then uh, it also becomes a, a dangerous thing because People think you're here like enjoying life, having time to answer every uh, single question they have. And uh, then they start asking for the tickets for the game and it just kind of collapses. And, you know, I'm trying to, uh, trying to save myself um, from this uh, influence in this moment, trying to only feed on the energy of people supporting us and uh, sending their love. But it's, uh, I have to tell you, it's a dangerous, a dangerous uh, thing. And uh, I really here, I don't have a lot of time. I have to rest, I have to eat, sleep. I have to prepare for the next game because we don't have two days, two, three days before, uh, between the games. We only have one. Tomorrow we play, yesterday we played. I mean, it's hard for us. We've never been in this situation. It's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, obstacles coming in our way how to prepare ourselves how to save ourselves how to recover ourselves and you know it's sometimes it also people don't know but it, for me and a lot of players like 90 percent players it's impossible to sleep after the game you had because the adrenaline pumping uh through your veins i i fell asleep 5 30 last night 5 30 and i wake up uh 9 30. That's you played the early game for, for, yeah, there's like four hours of sleep I had last night, but I can't, I can't sleep. There's like no possible way I can fall asleep after the game, and now I have to play tomorrow. So, yeah, this kind of stuff, you know, also people don't usually know, see because they didn't experience them. Yeah, yeah, and it's I guess the key thing is our blocking it out a little bit. I mean, on one side you want to enjoy the fact that exactly. you're getting this attention, but at the same time. You have to keep it going. Exactly, well, you have yeah. to find like the balance uh, between uh, the two. Bear, bearing that in mind, I won't keep you too much longer. <laughs> I'll let you go to, to lunch. Uh, I just want to ask you about, um, I saw a quote from Zoran, the coach, uh, who was saying that 
you know the the way the team is as a group seems to have changed recently as well like a one example of the way the team celebrated after beating Serbia a couple of years ago uh, with everyone out for uh, for the whole night and now here everyone's together at nine o'clock at dinner last night and enjoying the time together do you feel like the culture in this team has changed over the years because I mean your relationship with the team has had its ups and downs how do you feel it is for you right now but I think uh, that uh, when we uh, when national team was in in some kind of problems uh, a couple of years ago I mean like four or five years ago and when we uh, did decide to to come and play uh, the players from Bundesliga we did put a lot of pressure that the things have to change so the things did change for the better and at this moment um, uh, it was a great combination between young and a couple of older players. We all, most of our players are from the generation 92, 94, and those two generations uh, played together uh, through the all the uh, levels of Montenegro national team: pioneers, cadets, uh, juniors, and now the seniors. So we, I know these people 10, uh, 10 to 15 years, every single one of them, and it's just like too much his, uh, history between us. And uh, we don't have to make friendship. We're already friends. We just have to use this friendship to to our advantage to to win games, like we did on this Euro. And I think uh, that we are starting to realize how strong we can be when we believe and fight for each other. And I I, I just think we keep it going. Finally, then, now that you've had these victories at this championship, you've come into new territory. How do you think this team can define a successful championship at this point? A uh, really hard thing to answer because uh, uh, every, every, by, uh, with every game uh, the opinion of the people watching us and uh, maybe our own opinion is starting to change. Uh, what can we do now with this victory? We're starting to look at the schedule. We never look at the schedule. Like we, uh, we, we, after Slovenia, we are celebrating the locker room and then the music uh, turned off, uh, we were starting to pack for the bus. And then a couple of players turned around and said, yeah, but, but who are we crossing with? <laughs> Which groups? I promise you, nobody knew. Wow. Not even one single player knew who we were crossing with. That, that's, a, that's a promise. And then uh, now you beat Croatia with, with a big difference. And now you think you're the king of the world. But uh, the, tomorrow is the perfect team to put you on the ground. And you just have to play and, and play and don't push the so much uh, pressure or favorize anything and then with each game you see how long can you make it but the less you think about it I think it's the better for the team if you say can we do this it starts to coming to your head just think about the game try to win the game and then you will see at the end where, where you make it lovely to get your insight on all of this uh, dealing with it brilliantly having a great championship as well congratulations for so far and i hope it continues thank you so much thank you so much and nice wishes and uh, want to say hello to all handball fans in the world thank you Namosha. thank you Great stuff from Naboysha and very grateful for him to, to chat to us. He said to me just before the interview, I waited for an hour to talk to him because he had been interviewed uh, so many times. And I was like, you're a very, uh, very popular man and, and not a surprise there, Naboysha. Have you ever had so much interest in you in a championship? And he said, I've never had this much interest in me in my life. <laughs> 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 but he's deserved it he's been fantastic and he's um made montenegro a kind of outside dark horse in this group group one in budapest and uh that's not something i expected to say at any point i i don't know i think the horses are very dark in that group um because there are two very bright horses at the top of it that are very difficult to uh, look That's past um, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a great story uh, that group was full of great stories with uh, the Netherlands in there as well um, but yeah that, that group is looking like um, it, it may have two of the finalists in it. I mean for the, just in terms of the of Montenegro's run I, I probably at this stage I probably fancied him to beat the Netherlands. You know, I mean, they they were able to put away. I mean, the Croatian team they did face was probably Croatia's C team. Let's be let's be fair, like you know, but they did beat Slovenia, and that was Slovenia's more or less their A team. So they're they're able to to put together a, a big uh, 
a big game and I'd I probably fancied him over I think I changed my actually my prediction earlier in the day today from from Netherlands to Montenegro <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if that's allowed in our little oh, yeah. league but I'm doing it all I'm doing it all the time <laughs> and how's that working out for you <laughs> <laughs> well I'm moving up the yeah. table do you know yeah. and I I'm, I, I, I'm, I took overtook Alex and I'm missing like seven games which is quite incredible really when you think about it I, I've I've been sticking to my uh, initial predictions because I thought that was uh, that was part of the rules. But you know that's <laughs> oh, I, I, there's no need to do that. There, there's a lot of things that have changed in this championship. Yeah, I've actually moved up to twenty fourth now. So excuse me. So I'm actually doing very well. All of a sudden, you're, you're I moved up two hundred and fifty places in the overall ranking. You know, so I moved up. Oh, just it's all coming up Millhouse now. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said. A lot is changing, uh, particularly for this Dutch team. They've uh, lost both of their goalkeepers now uh, to COVID, unfortunately. The assistant coach, one of the goalkeeper coaches who, who was in the team two years ago, he was the uh, sub-goalie uh, yesterday, came on for a couple of minutes and saved three out of four shots. They're flying in two new goalkeepers for the game tomorrow. So, yeah, uh, we'll see what they can produce. I think they've, they've made their big moments uh, already at this championship. And... Uh, for me, though, the highlight of yesterday's games were was uh, Denmark against Iceland, which was a, a fantastic game and a uh, stressful couple of hours for me. Oh yes, please, <laughs> please tell us, Chris. You have to you have to break down the story right. first. There. So midway through the second game, Thomas Schuneich, the uh, head of EHF Media, comes across to me. I'm on the media tribune, and he says, "Chris, can I have a word?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course, Thomas." Uh, so I follow him outside. As we're walking out, I'm thinking, oh, God, what have we done? Like, what am I in trouble for here? Is it something that Stefan Kretschmar said? What has Alex tweeted? <laughs> but no, uh, it was word that, uh, unfortunately, Paul Bray, who is the commentator in Budapest, has uh, tested positive and that they needed someone to do the last game of commentary for the day. I said, of course, I'll do that. Uh, it was Denmark, Iceland, did a whole... 15 minutes of preparation and it was live and uh from what i remember i didn't balls it up so yeah that was that was fun i yeah i mean i really feel feel bad for paul in this situation uh, i wrote to him today he's not not feeling any kind of uh symptoms so hopefully he can recover soon and we'll be back uh, for the business end of the championship but yeah i'll be covering the rest of the main round it seems in budapest so uh yeah, nice to be in the commentary seat again. I thought it was over after Seged, but brought back in. And it was a great game to get back into it as well with Denmark-Iceland. And you have to feel sorry for Iceland because they really traded blows with Denmark. They really had just as much as... Uh, they had just as much to give as Denmark were offering. But there's one thing that Denmark have, and it's this majestic right back Matthias Giesel who just the brightest of the horses the brightest of the horses on the team of bright horses he is a shining light in the beacon of Hamburg he <laughs> has been 100% in this championship in his I mi- no he missed one yesterday um, sorry he missed one yesterday what? so for score Alex he can't trust it god damn it he was 9 from 10 yesterday and uh oh. 10 assists, so close to a double, an actual double-double. Not just a sexy six, but a double-double. But just to, to add to it, so it's it's not just the, the, the overall number here. It's when he made an impact. And it was really interesting to hear uh, Stefan Kretschmer talk about um, how there was doubt in the handball world about whether Matthias Giesel would actually be a um, the man on a team the the go-to guy and he was the go-to guy in two crucial periods in that game the first of which is uh, at the end of the first half where that's where Denmark won that game so it, it went from 12-12 to um 17-13 and then 17-14 at half time uh, and out of those five goals that um were scored there were four Matthias Gitzel breakthrough goals and one penalty, which was converted, was 
uh, drawn by Matthias Gissel and converted by Mikkel Hansen. So he just, he took over, made that gap. And in the second half again, Iceland scrapped back into the game. It was There's one goal in it. Matthias Gissel, three goals in a row. Game done. It was just incredible. He is phenomenal. And this was the first time watching it for me watching him live in the arena so as we know there is always a difference between watching people on tv and then watching them live in the arena for the first time and what strikes me is that iceland's defense knew exactly what was coming at them over and over again that little drop of the shoulder to the left fainting inside but there was nothing they just couldn't physically match him in that regard and it was a sight to behold. His timing is impeccable. I think that has a huge part to play in it. Winning penalty after penalty after penalty. And yeah, he and Kevin Muller, who came in as well late in the first half, I think that was a big, that made the difference as well at the other end. And Denmark, uh, not looking perfect. That was, a, that was a good test for them. Not looking completely infallible, but um, yeah, that, that, that'll that help them. Uh Let's say get a bit more, uh, get a bit of ring rust off for the the games later on in this main round. Yeah, it's a real shame for Iceland though as well. I mean, they were they were missing arguably their two of their best three players also with Pamisson and and uh, Bjarki Elison out. Uh, you'd wonder had they been there, would it have been even even closer again? But a lot of shoulda woulda could is in this tournament. But unfortunately for them, they they didn't have them there. And uh, yeah, that's gonna it's gonna sting a little bit more, oh. I think. When you know you're missing. Not a single player over the age of 30 in the squad yesterday. And uh, yes, Morrison and Magnussen were brilliant. Uh, just a, a great effort from everyone who, who was there. But uh, you could definitely feel like they needed a few more players in the left-hand side of the court. That's for sure. But uh, they're not out of it. They face France tomorrow night. Tonight, for those of you listening. And that is an opportunity for them. If they can pull it off. They'll be right back in the mix for the semi-final. Um, France missing Guillaume Gilles. He's got COVID, so head coach won't be there for the game. And uh, I mean, Iceland, yeah, of course. It's it's really hard to think of them seriously in, in, a, in an opportunity to win this game. But the way they played against Denmark, if they can repeat it, if they can somehow repeat it, maybe a bit more, uh, they'll have a chance. To, do any of you see them actually pull it off with the players they have? I don't think so. I think France are legitimately good. Um, the, the, they just they haven't been really tested so far, but they've um, kind of flown through the competition so far. It's really building up to that uh, pre-final preview between Denmark and France, uh, which I think will uh, will be an interesting one. Uh, I don't want to look too far ahead, but it, it is interesting that there might be a potential game where both teams are qualified um both teams are probably the best two teams in the competition they'll be on the two sides of the semi-final draw and potentially facing the final so then the question becomes you know wh- whether they will play at full force in that uh, last game or save some secrets for the final so that that's that'll be interesting but i, I think for me this group um, is not as exciting uh, as the other group in the competition where I truly believe that anything can happen. I, I think even Russia could still make it to the semifinals in that other group. Um, but um, still, yeah. Iceland, I wish they had their full squad because I, I think they could have tested both of those top two teams in Denmark and France. Parting words from the last couple of days, Brian? Let's start reciting a poem here or something. <laughs> I, I just hope that we still have a few more surprises coming up. The way Alex is talking about the group looks, the group one looks done and dusted already. I hope it's, I hope it's not. I would like, I would like a few more surprises and would mix it up a little bit more. So that's all I hope for, you know. And France, Iceland, look, who knows? I mean, I'd imagine it could be actually a very similar game to the, to the Iceland Denmark game, but. Raz has made a good point about it, that transitional play that Denmark and France are just too good at it. And if you come up with a team who does it slightly worse than you, you're you're gonna you're gonna lose to them nine times out of ten. But look, I, I'd I'd love to see Iceland beating France and really mix it all up. We'll find out how that one goes tonight. Thank you, Brian Campion. 
Thank you, Alex Kulash. Thank you to Naboisha Simic. And thank you for listening at home. We'll see you again in a couple of days' time. Goodbye.